Hi class, um, this is the first installment of your video um, having to do with the Miracle Worker and your first reading assignment, page 1, 223, Act 1. It's night over the Keller homestead. Inside, three adults in the bedroom are grouped around a crib in lamplight. They have been through a long vigil, and it shows in their tired, bearing, and disarranged clothing. One is a young, gentle woman with a sweet, girlish face, Kate Keller. The second is an elderly doctor, stethoscope at neck, thermometer in his fingers. The third is a hearty, gentle man in his 40s with chin whiskers. Captain Arthur Keller. She'll live. Oh, thank God. The doctor leaves them together over the crib and packs his bag. You're a pair of lucky parents. I can tell you now, I thought she wouldn't. Captain Keller says, nonsense, the child's a Keller. She had the constitution of a goat. She'll outlive us all. Yes, especially if some of you Kellers don't get a night's sleep. I mean you, Mrs. Keller. You hear her, Kate. I hear. I brought up two of them, but this is my wife's first. She isn't battle scarred yet. Doctor, don't be merely considerate. Will my girl be all right? Oh, by morning she'll be knocking down Captain Keller's fences again. And is there anything else we should do? Pick up stronger fencing, huh? Just let her get well. She knows how to do it better than we do. The doctor is packed and ready to go. Main thing is the, fe is the fever gone. These things come and go in infants. Never know why. Call it acute congestion of the stomach and brain. I'll say you to your buggy doctor. I've never seen a baby more, more vital, more vitality. That's the truth. He beams a good night at the baby and Kate, and Keller leads him downstairs with the lamp. They go down the porch steps and across the yard, where the doctor goes off left. Keller stands with the lamp aloft. The lamp is high. Kate meanwhile is bent lovingly over the crib, which emits a bleat. Her finger is playful with the baby's face. Hush, don't cry now. You've been trouble enough. Call it acute ingestion indeed. I don't see who's so cute about congestion just because it's yours. We'll have your father run an editorial in his paper. The wonders of modern medicine. They don't know what they're curing, even when they cure it. Men, men and their battle scars. We women will have to. But she breaks off, puzzled. Moves her finger before the baby's eyes. We'll have to, Helen. Now she moves her hand quickly. Helen? She snaps her fingers at the baby's eyes twice, and her hand flatters. After a moment, she calls out loudly, Captain, Captain, will you come? But she stares at the baby and her next call is directly at her ears. Captain! 
And now, still staring, Kate screams. Keller, in the yard, hears it and runs with the lamp back to the house. Kate screams again, and her look intent on the baby and terrible. Keller hurries in and up. Katie, what's wrong? Look. She passes her hand in the crib at the baby's eyes. What, Kate? She's, well, she needs only time to. She can't see. Look at her eyes. She takes the lamp from him and moves it before the child's face. She can't see. Helen! Or here. When I scream, she didn't blink. Not an eyelash. Helen! Helen! She can't hear you. Helen! His face is something like a fury in it, crying the baby's name. Kate, almost fainting, presses her knuckles to her mouth to stop her own cry. The room dims out quickly. Time, in the form of a slow tune, distant, distant belfry chimes, which approaches a crescendo and then fades, passes, the light comes up upon, again, on a day five years later, on three kneeling children and an old dog outside around the pump. The dog is a setter named Belle, and she is sleeping. Two of the children are Negroes, Marcy and Percy. The third child is Helen, six and a half years old, quite unkept, in a body a vicious little person, with a fine head, attractive but noticeably blind, one eye larger and protruding. Her gestures are abrupt, inconsistent, lacking in human restraint, and her face never smiles. She is flanked by the other two in a litter of paper doll cutouts. And while they speak, Helen's hands thrust inside their faces in turn, feeling baffled at the movement of their lips. First, I'm going to cut off the doctor's legs. One, two, three, now then. Why are you cutting off the doctor's legs? I'm going to give him an operation. Now I'm going to cut off his arms. One, two, now I'm going to fix him up. She pushes Helen's hand away from her mouth. You stop that. Cut off his stomach. That's a good operation. No, I'm going to cut off his head first. He got a bad cold. Ain't going to be much of that doctor left to fix up. Time you finish all them opera. But Helen is poking her fingers inside his mouth to feel his tongue. He bites at them, annoyed, and she jerks them away. Helen now fingers her own lips, moving them in an imitation. But What do you do, bite her hand? That's how I do. She keep poking her fingers in my mouth. I just bit them off. What's she trying to do now? She's trying to talk. She's going to get mad. Look at She's trying to talk. Helen is 
scroll, scowling. The lips under her fingertips moving in a ghostly silence, growing more and more frantic until a bizarre rage she bites at her own fingers. This sends Percy off to a laughter, but, but alarms Martha. Hey, you stop now. She pulls Helen's hands down. You just sit quiet, and But at once, Helen topples Martha on her back, knees pinning her shoulders down, and grabs the scissors. Martha screams. Percy darts to, to the bell string on the porch, yanks it, and the bell rings. Inside, the lights have been gradually coming up on the main room, where we see the family informally gathered, talking but a pantomime. Kate six darning socks near a cradle, occasionally rocking it. Captain Keller in spectacles is working over newspaper pages at a table. A benign visitor in a hat. Aunt Ev is sharing the sewing basket, putting the finishing touches on a big shapeless doll made of towels. An indolent young man, James Keller, is at the window watching the children. With the ring of the bell, Kate is instantly on her feet and out the door onto the porch to take in the scene. Now we see what these five years have done to her. The girlish playfulness is gone. She is a woman, steeled in grief. Kate, for the thousandth time, Helen! She is down the steps at once to them, seizing Helen's wrists and lifting her off Martha. Martha turns off in tears and screams for Mama with Percy after her. Let me have those scissors. Helen, let me have those scissors. Meanwhile, the family inside is alerted. Aunt Ev is joining James at the window. Captain Keller resumes work. James, she only dug Martha's eyes out. Almost dug. It's always almost. No point of worrying till it happens, is there? They gaze out while Kate reaches for her scissors in Helen's hand. But Helen pulls the scissors back, then struggles for them a moment. Then Kate gives up. Let's Helen keep them. She tries to draw Helen into the house. Helen jerks away. Kate next goes down on her knees, takes Helen's hands gently, and using the scissors like a doll, makes Helen caress and cradle them. She points, Helen's fingers, houseward. Helen's whole body now be becomes eager. She surrenders the scissors. Kate turns her towards the door and gives her a little push. Helen scrambles up towards the house and Kate, rising, follows her. And Ev, how does she stand it? Why haven't you seen this Baltimore man? He's not a thing you can let go on and on like the weather. The weather here doesn't ask permission of me, Aunt Ev. Speak to my father. Arthur, something ought to be done for that child. A refreshing suggestion. What? Kate enters, turns Helen to Aunt Ev, who gives her the towel doll. What's this? Very famous occultist in Baltimore I wrote you about. What was his name? Dr. Chisholm? Yes, I heard lots of cases of blind blindness people thought couldn't be cured. He cured. He just does wonders. Why don't you write to him? I've stopped believing in wonders. I think the captain will write to him soon.